clean technologies. So the search for rare earth elements and other critical minerals, um, traditionally they are mined. They are mined in hard rocks. Um, REEs, when you start looking in the literature, we find them most often when we're looking at igneous and metamorphic bodies. Uh, looking at them for igneous bodies, they are often associated with certain blocks as they're melting. We can kind of get an idea of where they're coming from in timing. Um, we find them oftentimes, again, in hard rocks when we're mining them in high enough concentrations. Um, we are starting to explore other options too, like looking at shales. Uh, shales naturally when shales particularly black shales when they are being deposited and preserved it's in a very similar environment that needs sulfide loving metals too so we tend to find a high concentrations relatively high concentrations of nickel um, and a couple other nickel copper and a couple other metals in there too so one potential option particularly with all of our um with all of our new technologies and drilling, we're doing a lot of laterals, we're doing a lot of horizontal wells. Why can't we take those cuttings, leach those metals out and use that instead of just simply throwing away the cuttings? The cuttings are gonna to be tossed anyway. Um, another potential is brines. So when we start looking at the brines and the subsurfaces, um, these are considered waste products. Oftentimes, if we're looking at um, oil field brines, um, they're just taken elsewhere and injected back into the subsurface. They're disposed of. However, they're looking at lithium in the smack over brines when they're producing. And they're ha they have high enough concentrations that is economical, coupled with the fact that lithium is bonded to um, calcium, which is its preferred form. Lithium either likes to bond to um, oxygen or it bonds to calcium. And so it's it can bond to other things too, but those are two primary things we find in the geologic history um, or in geologic materials, I mean. And so in the smack over brines, it tends to bond to the calcium. So it's a preferred form, high enough concentration. So they are actively producing it. Um, and then also there's potential for coals. So in 2017, DOE released a report where they're finding rare earth elements, lithium, and other metals associated not just with the coal seams, but also the fire clays underneath too. Um, again, these are in high enough concentrations that they can be economical. So now they're working on extraction technologies. So another thought is that we can get critical minerals out of seawater. They have tried for years to get uranium and gold out of seawater. Same with lithium. Um, these are in Pretty low concentrations though. So here we have PPM on the y-axis and we have various elements on the x-axis. Um, you'll see that we have strontium upwards of about 13 PPM and everything kind of starts trailing off towards the end. Um, in this bottom set, we're in, we're in pretty small concentrations towards the end. Um, these are just so diluted in seawater that they are just not economical yet. However, what if we can take power of nature and concentrate it with the sun, right? They do this anyway over in the Middle East. They do this in other locations where they're already mining, um, surface mining, I guess you can call it, but they're taking seawater, concentrating it down, just using the sun and different um, evaporation pools, and they're precipitating out various minerals. So if we find them in seawater, what about other evaporated, evaporites then? We know we can do it, we do it now. What about ancient ones too? So with that thought, we started looking at modern evaporites. We know that they do it elsewhere. What about other places? Let's see how what the REE concentrations are in these. Um, so in Sears Lake in California, it's part of Death Valley. It's an endorheic lake, it's arid, it's dry. Um, we have um, the Sierra Nevadas towards the west. There's a lot of subsurface recharge coming into this lake. It's currently exploited for salt, borax, gypsum, all these different evaporitic minerals. Um, those solutes that they're finding in this lake are gonna be coming from either the Sierra Nevada granitoids, so again, hard rocks, um, or there's hydrothermal springs that are feeding that lake. Again, coming from hard rocks or magma sources. And so we had one of these. So this is kind of, this was our proof of concept. This was our, essentially our modern analog to everything else we were doing. Um, so down here, we have this pink um, 
copper crystal. This is from Sears Lake. They are absolutely beautiful. This whole sample is about the size of my hand. It sits in the palm of my hand. And so we went through and we just took an XRF. Um, so it just, it's non-destructive. It sits on the surface. And we just started measuring what do we have in here? Um, and what we were finding is that we measured on the hopper crystal, this dark pink mass right here. And then if you flip it over, there's an underside light pink ground mass too. We measured all of them because there's a lot of other things in these also. When we get table salt, it's pure. However, that's been processed. So when we're looking at salt to nature, and I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of floors and stuff, um, they're not pure, they're dirty. <laughs> there's a lot of other things in there too. So. When we start looking, our blue lines are our crystal, the lovely light pink crystal. Our orange line is that dark pink, dark pink ground mass on top. And the gray line is the underside, the light pink ground mass that you can't see. So when we start measuring, we find that we have a lot of chlorine. Um, pure salt, it's a little over 60% chlorine. The rest of it's sodium. Um, we cannot measure sodium with our particulate um, XRF. So what we're finding is that the hopper crystal is pretty much pure salt. Um, our underside light pink mass, pretty much pure salt. However, our orange, our dark pink ground mass, um, not quite so much. There's a lot of other things in there too. Um, look at that one. We also have sulfur, which is probably anhydrite in this situation. Um, same with the other ones. We do have a little bit of sulfur in our other salt bodies or in our other salt sections in here too. Um, a little bit of potassium, not really. A little bit of calcium, um, and that's about it. So looking at some of the trace elements, though, what we're finding is that we actually have concentrated levels of vanadium in the underside light pink ground mass. We actually have concentrations of titanium in here, too, a um, little bit of barium. We have elevated levels of uranium. Um, but then looking at the rare earth elements, um, dinium, prosodinium, cesium, lanthium, scandium, and yttrium. We're finding that we have elevated levels of these two. Just for reference, when they're looking at igneous rocks to mine, they're looking at hundreds of ppm of rare earth elements, and that's considered economical. So what we're finding in here that we range anywhere from about 125 ppm all the way upwards of potentially um, 800 ppm, depending on our elements, and they do range throughout. But what we're seeing is that we do have elevated rare earth elements in these, that we're able to essentially concentrate what we're finding either in naturally occurring seawater or any other potential solutes that's being transported, and we're putting them in our evaporites. So are there critical elements, minerals, in other evaporic bodies across the United States? Because this could be a potential source for us, a homegrown source, essentially. Um, the other positive, another potential easy point of if these were to be exploited for rare earth elements and other metals, um, because they are an evaporitic body, because it's salt, it's actually really easy to mine. A lot of times we take these anyway and we're dissolving out cavities in order to produce either storage or something else anyway. So these are actually, it would be an easy way of also doing these. So we had four sets of samples. Um, we have the Silurian Salina Group in Lake County, Ohio, up in here. Um, we have the Permian Hutchison Salt in Reno County, Kansas. We have the Permian Salado Salt in Pecos County, Texas. And then we have Jurassic Luan Salt in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we use our main methods, a um, Thermal Niton XL3T Gold Plus. It's a handheld XRF. Depending on how the samples were, if they were cuttings, um, or hand samples, they were crushed, sieved, and packed into um, an XRF holder. If they were core, we kept them slabbed and we cleaned the front face of the core with DI water. Um, we would take every now and again a piece of that core, crush it, sieve it, pack it, and just run them just to make sure that everything's kosher and everything's coming out good. Each sample takes about five minutes to run, so it's relatively quick. Even if we crush it, it's still able to be rerun multiple times. There's no actual destruction to the sample. We get elemental compositions from anywhere from magnesium to uranium. Um, however, here we focused on bulk, um, critical, and REAs. 
And that's just for simplicity. We don't have calibrations for all the elements. We have about 40 elements on our calibration. Um, these in particular are what we were focusing on. We also took a handful. We ran them on XRD just to verify what we're seeing. And then we also ran a handful on it SEM2 to kind of look at the crystal structure in there. Because based upon crystal structure, we can even either see if these were primary um, evaporites or if they've been dissolved and reprecipitated. Re so have they had some kind of diagenetic component to them too? So we're going to start going through all these. Our Permian Hutchison salt is located in Kansas. Um, this bed, so this salt bed is a, it's a halite interbedded with gray black shale um, embedded gypsum and anhydrite. It's actually, when we're looking at it, there's a lot of red beds in there too, a lot of red clays. Um, or sorry, just a little bit of red in there. I was, I'm sorry, I was getting confused with this a lot of for a minute. Um, there is a little bit of red in there. And so there's kind of conflicting studies on this one's source. Some people say this was marine in origin. Some people say it's continental in origin. So was this like the Luam where we have rifting of the continents and we have massive deposition across the Gulf of Mexico, or perhaps was this a lake that was starting to, um, that was restricted and dried up? Um, trust me, we can't find much from this type of study. However, um, some people go back and forth. So we're right here, um, just as um, we're starting to rip apart right in there. So the Permian Hutchison Salt in Kansas, there's a Hutchison Salt mine right in here. This entire gray area is actually the um, extent of the Hutchison salt. And so we're at one of the edges. This has been known for hundreds and hundreds of years to modern humans, I guess, probably even thousands of years to um, not quite so modern humans. But there are shallow brine pools across Kansas that wildlife has been using for um, well before we were here. It's currently mined at the Hutchison Salt Mine. Um, it's not used for table salt. Um, you're going to see in some of the pictures, it's not, it's not clean per se. However, it's used for road salt. They do get a little bit of snow and ice up in Kansas. Um, it's used oftentimes for feedstock, so for animals. And then it's used to um, an oil well mud, either to weight it down a little bit, but really it's to affect the pH and salinity of it. And so the Permian Hutchison salt in Kansas, so we had hand samples of this. This was taken directly from the mine on a field trip, actually. And so when you're looking at this, what we have, we have this white salt body, Oops, sorry. We have this white salt here and all this little gray, these dark pieces in here, those are, um, those are clay bits in here. This is a white piece with this, these black specks in here are actually organic. So when you go through and crush this, you can smell the sulfur being released in here. And then finally we have, um, we have this white piece and then we also have some red coming in here too. So whenever I say Hutchison white with organics, we're looking here. Um, Hutchison White right in here, and Hutchison Red is right in here. Um, so we went through, we crushed these, we ran them on the XRF. Um, so what's considered economical for REEs is hundreds. So like 100, 200, 300 ppm. And so it kind of depends on the element. Lithium at one point in time, 7 ppm was deemed economical, probably depending on where. Um, but now I think it's like 100, a couple hundred ppms. And so there's a lot of factors that go into it, like where they get in it from, right? What form is it in? But um, it's not a lot. And so it's kind of crazy to think about because when we're looking at um, like iron, when they're looking at mining iron, they want 50% iron in that body for it to be economical. And a lot of these metals they need percentages, like high percentages. And so when we're looking at the rare earth elements, it's it's really not a lot. So, um, okay, sorry. So coming back to the Hutchison salt, when we're looking at this, we do have primarily chlorite, or sorry, chlorine. Um, it is a salt body. Um, looking through, we do have elevated levels of sulfur, some potassium, um, and calcium. So the Hutchison red has the highest levels of potassium. That's probably a little bit of, of sylvite in that body. Um, this sulfur is most likely um, anhydrite in here. It's known to have anhydrites throughout. The calcium is going to be 
most likely corresponding to the sulfur um, that's going to be part of that anhydride body. And so in here, we don't really have very much siliciclastic component. That's going to be our silicone. Um, same with our magnesium. Um, so coming through, looking at some of the trace elements, we have a little bit of magnesium. Um, we have a little bit elevated levels of chromium. Um, the interesting part of this one is our barium does have a little bit of elevated levels, upwards of 200 ppm. Some of these salts will have percentages of barium, and that is most likely a form of barite in the drilling mud. However, this came straight from the mine, so that's naturally occurring, and that's not a contamination in here. Um, these have high levels of strontium. I am unsure of the economic value of strontium that you need, um, but strontium is known to be enriched in salt bodies also. Um, looking at isotopes, which we didn't do isotopes in here, you can actually get an idea if it's freshwater versus freshwater influence versus seawater influence. Um, and so, and I'm unsure if they've done this before on the Hutchison. But then looking at our rare earth elements, we have elevated levels of eudinium, prosodinium, cesium, and lanthium. We don't really have any scandium, I'm sorry, and yttrium. Um, I actually didn't find yttrium, just as a spoiler, through any of the salt bodies. So, um, but these other ones kind of vary throughout so we have upwards of 600 ppm in neodymium in that red portion right in here, the one that's associated with the sulfite. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the Salado salt in Texas. So during this time, we're in a very, we're in about the same time period. We're just in a different part of the world, a little bit further um, modern day south. However, then it was a little further west. So during this time, we have withdrawal of these inland seas that cover much of the region during the Pennsylvania. Um, at this time, there is there are massive red beds throughout, red clay beds throughout. It's a lot of tidal flats. Um, it's hot. It's arid. And so we have a lot of dirty salts being precipitated throughout West Texas across this area. Um, the Permian salt in Sorry, the Permian Salado salt in Texas. So it's part of the, um, it's associated with the Rustler and the Dewey Lake um, coming up out of the Central Basin platform. Um, this, uh, these are some of the cores that we have. These are located in the core repository that we have on campus. Uh, as you can see, it is not that beautiful white table salt <laughs> that most people associate. It is red. We do have some sections, so that's what this hand sample is. That came from the same core, it's just a different box. But a lot of this has, a lot of that tidal flat influence in there, a lot of those clays. Um, it's bedded with potassium berries, barren salts, bedded with shales. There's a ton of organic conclusions throughout. So all this dark color right throughout here, those are in organics. Um, the interesting part of this one, and we haven't done this part of the study yet, but it has meter to centimeter scales of anhydrite, polyhalite, halite, and fine grain silicic plastics. You can actually measure and see climate cyclicity in these cores. Particularly, I've been informed I should go to some of the mines. You can see them in the mines if we can get access to them. You can just measure these sections and just get an idea of how they're changing. Um, this one's upwards of 1,300 feet, so about 400 meters thick, and it can go down to about 2,500 feet or about 762 meters below the surface. So it's not that deep, actually, um, compared to the Luan, which is going to come later. That one goes from like 9,000 to 20,000 feet at the samples that we have, all the way through some are pretty shallow in the Luan. But um, overall, the Salado is not that deep. So here we are in West Texas. We had core. Um, we measured it at about a foot interval, so you'll see a little bit of jagginess to this one, particularly compared to some of the other ones. And we were out in West Texas. This core came from West Texas. So looking at these down core, um, we have chlorine, which is going to represent our halite body. We have sulfur, which is going to represent our sulfates. We have calcium, um, which is going to be sulfates or it's going to be a carbonate because you can see from here, there's not quite, there's a little bit of, there's a couple peaks that match up, but overall there's not, it's not a one-to-one. 
Um, but what we see overall, when we're looking at our bulk elements going down, we have salt with some clay and silt inclusions in here. Um, so particularly looking through this one, so even still our salt, um, it's a little over 60%. Um, it's about 65%. And that's because we have that, we have other things bonding to it too. And so looking at this, we can see we do not have that pure white salt. Um, it is dirty. It has um, clay inclusions coming through right in here. And then every now and again, we have those anhydrate beds coming in too. It's not really a bed per se. It's more it's mixed in. I'm sorry, I misspoke on that. And so our going through and looking at our trace elements again, we are, we're looking at um, barium, manganese, chromium, strontium, zirconium, and cobalt. These are going to be our main ones. Um, these going down, they kind of vary throughout. Our manganese is going to be actually pretty consistent, but it's still at a pretty low ppm. Uh, it's about 300 ppm. Um, our barium is going to vary throughout. Our strontium is also varying throughout. Same with our chromium and our cobalt. Um, some of these can reach upwards of 600 ppm, but overall they're at pretty low levels, particularly for some of these not rare earth element trace elements. Um, so looking through that middle section, we can see that these a lot of these are varying, most likely because our lithology is varying down section too. So here's our um, siliciclastic component. So what we see is some of these, particularly like our strontium, it's lining up pretty good with where our silt or where our clays are coming into. Strontium and even still zirconium, which honestly it peaks somewhat. There's a little bit of correlation between them. Um, those are often associated with um, clay minerals and clay components. So looking at the rare earth elements as we're going down core, we have lanthium, prosodinium, cesium, tellurium, eudinium, and scandium. Um, yttrium, zero. We have nothing in there either. <laughs> so we just left it off of these ones. And so it's kind of interesting to see our lanthium, prosodinium, and eudinium are going to vary pretty consistently with each other. Our cesium and tellurium are going to vary pretty consistently with each other also. They do that not always, but a lot of the times throughout these salt bodies. Um, when looking through the literature, you see that cesium and tellurium are oftentimes associated with each other. I need to do a better search on the other three, but I'm assuming that they are probably precipitating out around the same time. They're enriching with each other. They have very similar methods of enrichment. Um, so looking through these, again, looking through that middle of that section, we have some variability. Um, again, these are going to be associated with, the, I'm pretty sure, with the different lithologies. However, it's not exactly one to one. I can't tell you with this, and honestly, I can't tell you with most of these. Um, these are very specifically associated with the anhydrites. These are very specifically associated with the salts. These are very specifically associated with the shales. And I think that has a lot to do with um, diagenesis, a lot of secondary processes. So a lot of these salts are not primary. Um, they were precipitated out at the surface. However, once they've been buried, there's a lot of potential for dissolution and reprecipitation. And so I believe a lot of these have a lot of other um, subsurface water influence, um, if not a few other things that are kind of coming into play here. We're still trying to tease that out. Um, so on average, we have about 390 um, lanthium, 645 prosodinium. Our cesium is very, very, it has these peaks and troughs. Um, in this body, if, if it was to focus on cesium and tellurium, you would have to find a horizon, it looks like, whereas the other ones are very consistent down core. Um, we're averaging about 24 ppm for cesium, 65 ppm for tellurium, and eudinium, we're upwards of 1,000 ppm, which is absolutely fabulous if we're looking at this from an economic standpoint. Um, again, our lanthium, prosodinium and eudinium are correlating, or cesium and tellurium correlate. So our Luan salt um, is an absolute massive salt body. It's located along throughout the Gulf, um, particularly in the East Texas Basin. So in um, the well that we're looking at here is actually offshore. Um, it's the Puma well, associated with the Puma dive here. However, this is so, there are multiple salt basins. Um, the offshore is 
you could think of this being a giant salt basin. There's multiple fingers coming out actually with other salt basins, but it's all the Luan approximately the same time during the Jurassic. Um, they're still working out some of the timing exact, exactly because there's no fossils in here. So they know age in the Norflet, they know the age in the Warner. They're still kind of piecing together the exact timing of the Luan. So during this time, we have rifting of North America from South America. We have restriction of the Gulf of Mexico. And so what we're doing is essentially pooling and um, concentrating seawater in this area. And what we're getting is this absolutely massive salt body precipitating. It is upwards of four kilometers thick. That is in many places incomprehensible. We have no modern analog for this type of salt body, honestly. Um, throughout, it's mostly halite, but there's silty and sandy halite intervals throughout. Um, there's impure halite intervals throughout. We're getting some little bit of sylvite. We get a little bit of anhydrites and carbonates in there too. Um, sometimes we have beds. Sometimes it's just kind of sprinkled throughout mixed with the salt body. Um, okay. Which element were you talking about, Bob? I'm sorry, I just saw that pop up. So looking at the Luan, um, we can do something very similar. Um, I'm just going to keep talking. I'm really good at talking. So, um, <laughs> so very similar to what we do with chemistry tigerfi, we have our elements and they essentially represent something in our, um, in our mineral form. So here, our Luan, we're going to have our silicone and magnesium. Those are going to represent our um, silicic plastic group component. Yes. Yeah, our heavy rare earth elements are going to be more valuable than our light rare earth elements. Um, the ones that I'm focusing, those are the ones that we can measure. We're working on getting more, um, getting more calibrations so we can look at more, but we just haven't gotten there yet. So, um, but thank you. So our silicone and magnesium is going to represent our silicic plastic component. Our chlorine is going to represent our halite. Our sulfur is going to represent our anhydrite, and our Calcium is going to be a little complicated. Um, coming through, there we go. So looking at our, this is our elemental concentration of either sulfur, magnesium, or silicone. Um, coming through at the bottom, it's calcium. Um, there are various correlations with here. Sometimes it's going to be with our anhydrite component. And sometimes it's going to be with our carbonate component. It just kind of depends. Um, so calcium is a little bit complicated. When we start looking down section, um, what we see is that we're kind of variable. So with our silicone, we have these little intervals. We have high silicone, we have high siliciclastic component, and then we have these little bumps, for lack of a better word, coming through until we're at the base, where we again have a high siliciclastic component. Um, our chlorine is going to be variable throughout. It kind of mirrors. It's going to be opposite of our silicone or siliciclastic component. Our um, sulfur seems to be increasing down section. This is not to say that it increases down section of the Luan um, because we are in a giant dive here on this section. Um, it's, not in, it's not in place. So um, it's been overturned. I'm actually going to show you just a touch of seismic. And so you can kind of see some of the internal structures in here. Um, our calcium is not mere, it's not mimicking our sulfur, which is another way we can tell it's not just with the anhydrite. There's some other things going on in here too. And then finally, our magnesium is going to, it pretty closely mimics our silicone, our siliciclastic component. So using this, we can divide this up into sections. So um, we have Above this, we have Pliocene Miocene strata. We have the Luan salt section with some other body in here. And then finally, we have a Miocene salt or Miocene section, siliciclastic section at the base. So this section right in here is actually what they call a suture zone. Um, this is where we had two salt bodies collide, and we have an entrainment of sediment coming through here, where we have variable lithology that's unknown to the, um, to the drillers. And so knowing that lithology can actually help them, because these could be either overpressurized or underpressurized. Um, overpressurized can cause a blowout. Underpressurized, they can 
um, lose a lot of mud and a lot of time. So um, what we actually found in this section, we're not going to talk too much about this. There's a lot of salt in it. However, it's salt coated with um, quartz grains, coated with sand grains, mica, a couple other clays. Um, and there's a lot of hematite actually in there too. So when we're looking at this on the seismic, so right in here is our well. We're just going to call it the Puma well. This is coming from the southwest side of the um, of the diapir, and this comes up to the northeast side of the diapir. Um, this kind of blurred out section in here, this is our salt body coming through. And so what we have in the middle are actually some of those entrained sediments. So right in here, um, looking at this, this is our section. Um, right in here is right in here. Somewhere one of these little lines in here represents is probably our suture zone in there. So we're trying to work out exactly where we're at in there, but a lot of this are these sediments in there. Um, so being able to actually have a better understanding of how the Luan varies down section, um, not just from a trace element, which we're going to get back to in a minute, but even on the bulk side can actually help with either modeling seismic or modeling movement or a couple other things. So, oh, I still have a line. So let's just skip ahead. There we go. So the Luan salt, if we're looking at the trace elements, we have barium, magnesium, chromium, strontium, zirconium, and um, cobalt. Um, the barium and chromium are probably contamination. So these are from an offshore well. They've been cleaned. However, when you open the package, you can smell that drilling fluid. So um, the magnesium is actually met mimicking barium. It's, it's probably a part of that too. Um, so, but our strontium, zirconium, those are actually, those mimic a little bit more siliciclastic component. So those are probably associated with the clay minerals in there. And then cobalt, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But we're upwards of probably about, um, we're, we're averaging about 75 ppm on that one. So looking at our rare earth elements, um, again, what we're finding is that we have elevated levels of lanthium, protheidium, cesium, tellurium, eudidium, and scandium. We don't have any yttrium. Um, scandium is different than our last section, which had none. This actually has a, one peak here, and that is associated again with our um, suture zone. So overall, we're really not finding any in the salt bodies. However, we are finding elevated levels of these rare earth elements in here. And we have very similar correlations as the last body. Lanthium, protheidium, eudidium correlated in the salt. Cesium, tellurium correlated in the salt. Um, no scandium really in the salt, just a little peak. It's a little bit more in the clay minerals um, with the siliciclastic component. And then we're anywhere, we vary from zero on average upwards to about 214 for the new didium. So and the, these can, like any particular point, goes from anywhere from non-existent up towards to almost 900 ppm. So sorry, I'm just trying to. Um, so looking at the Slurian Salina group, um, we are deposit. Okay, so the Slurian Salina group is in Ohio. It's deposited in a sob cut to slime as a subsea conditions. And what we have during this time is opening and closing of the basin. Um, what, during this time, we also have connections to the Michigan basin. So we have this massive, not quite as massive, um, not quite as massive as. Um, the Luan, but some of these overall as a section, it's about a thousand feet, so about 300 meters or so. Um, and so this is different from the Luan, is that it's very cyclical in nature. The Luan was massive um, evaporation and concentration. This one has a lot of other things in here. It's dolostrine, hydrate, shale, and siltstone. It represents about 1.5 million years of deposition. And so we can see this. So looking at the well log, anything highlighted on here are salt bodies. Um, so coming through, this was actually a little bit different of a goal. We started this when I was back in Ohio. We were mapping these salt bodies to kind of get an idea of current reserves to the salt. Um, and so we ended up taking a core from Lake County, Ohio. We did XRF, XRD, and SEM on it. And there was a ton of mapping too, but we're not going to show that. Um, but the goal of this one was also, again, reserves and to evaluate the depositional environment. So looking at the core, um, again, we have a lot of halide in here. 
it's one of our more it's one of our lengthier cores that we have this one's mostly hand samples and the cores are located back in ohio um, it's coarsely crystalline it has organic conclusions and they range in color from um, yellow to dark gray to reddish pink um, there's dendritic shales throughout and we have a lot of beds with fracture fills um, looking at it at an SEM, we have what could be interpreted as a chevron pattern. Um, but then also when we're looking at it, what we're finding is not beautiful um, halite crystals going back. Rather, we do have some salt precipitated in fractures and pores. So potentially this could be um, primary nature, the chevrons, but definitely this right here where we have fractures um, and pores being reprecipitated, that is secondary nature. That's indicating that there's been dissolution and reprecipitation of the salt body. Um, so we also have a lot of anhydrite in here. Um, it's honestly a little bit boring. It's dark gray to black, it's massive. And we have an occasional fossil that we do find throughout. Um, we have a lot of dolostone in here. It is buff to gray. We have a lot of anhydrite growth coming through here. So we are depositing in a shallow, um, setting. And so as the waters are evaporating off after we have these algal mats already there, we start having anhydrites that are starting to precipitate out within them. Um, we have algal laminations. Sorry, I just spoiled that. Um, mud cracks. And we also have some oil staining in here too. And so that's most likely primary nature, it's self sourcing. Um, we do have, um, oh, sorry, here's some more anhydrite growths coming through here. Um, we also have pyrite inclusions within the anhydrite. So this is an anhydrite growth throughout here. And so we start having pyrite within it precipitating out. Um, and then sometimes we have partial dull tumefaction. We still have some high levels of calcium in here. Um, looking at the anhydrite growths in core, so that black in that core is what they would look like going down section. So what this is going to this does is create a cyclical pattern of deposition due to evaporation and siliciclastic influx. And then we have some re, um, we have fresh water entering the basin and kind of recharging everything. Fresh water or seawater, it could be either way. So going down section, we can do something similar. We have our siliciclastic component, our halite component, our anhydrite component, and then we also have a dolostone component. Um, we can come through, we can start dividing it up. Um, this is labeled from the, it goes from A at the base, and I didn't have A in the score, all the way through the G at the top. And so it goes up section. They target different salts for different reasons, actually. Um, and so coming through, so we can see, we can get a, a lithology column going down. Um, oh, sorry. And so what we're finding is, again, is that cyclical nature to everything as we're coming through. Um, and so looking at some of the trace elements, again, we have barium, magnesium, chromium, strontium, zirconium, um, and then I can't quite see cobalt. And so we can divide it with lithology. And so what we're finding is that, again, these are very variable down core. Um, really what our strontium is actually associated very, correlates very well with our sulfur, um, it's replacing it and making celestite. Um, our zirconium, again, correlates with our siliciclastic components of those shales as they're coming through. And then finally, um, our chlorine overall is what we're finding is that there is variable amounts being entrained within there. So some of these could be associated with perhaps the shale that's getting mixed in, um, but there's a little bit of these trace elements that are found in there. However, most are found elsewhere, elsewhere in some of the other lithologies. Um, common down section, so looking at our rare earth elements, um, again, these are variable down core, and they do correlate well with each other. Um, and so what we're finding overall is that we don't have a very specific lithology. Oops, sorry. Um, as you can see, they're all over the place. They're not necessarily just correlated in these halite bodies. They're also found in some of the other evaporitic bodies, too. Um, in fact, in higher concentrations. Um, so we can get upwards of 600 ppm in some of these rare earth elements. However, we can get upwards of 1300 in some of the other ones, um, particularly in the anhydrites. So the anhydrites are actually concentrating these a little bit more than what the salt bodies are. Um, so what we're finding is that it's variable throughout. They range on average from almost non-existent all the way upwards of about um, 390 ppm in the um, so 
overall, I just give you a whole lot of numbers. There are a lot of variations in bulk and trace elements in these salt bodies at similar concentrations as hard rocks be in mind. Um, so looking at the bulk elements, we range anywhere from um, some of them are non-existent in aluminum all the way upwards. Obviously, we have chlorine of 60%. Um, some of these other trace elements, they're highly variable throughout. Um, however, looking at some of the rare earth elements, they actually exhibit very similar enrichment patterns within these, although their magnitudes are different. Um, a lot of these variabilities, short of all of this, is going to be um, a lot of this has dissolution events. All of these are not primary. In they're not primary anymore. They're not, they've been altered by basin flushing events um, or other potential um, events. And so they have various sources. So some of them may simply be seawater. Some of them could potentially have um, similar to what's going on in Sears Lake, where you have a granitoid influx, but also you have potential for um, Sub, or subsurface waters also enrich in those. And then maybe some of these have freshwater influxes too. So it's diluting them down. Um, so I promised I would show you some of the rare earth, some of the REEs looking at, um, at what they're targeting and one of the mining. So right now, American Rare Earths has the Hella Creek project area, um, which is up in Wyoming. So they're looking at the Overton Mountain and then also I believe there's another mountain in this area. And so these are oxides, so they're it's a little bit different. However, what we're finding is that they're similar in magnitudes in these salt bodies. Um, so I'm, I'm running over on time, I'm really sorry. So I'm just trying to hurry this along. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Um, and I will gladly take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Uh, so um, we are open for questions. If you have any question, please. So um, Siloa, did I pronounce that correct, correctly in the chat? Was you mentioned there's no analog for the Luan for the Zeichen salt from the Danish North Sea be used as an analog? I think it's pretty big, thick. Um, there's no modern analog, is what I meant. But I think you're right. So I think the if I remember correctly, the Zeich, the sorry, <laughs> um, they have a very similar, um, very similar movements. Um, they tend to form very extensive um, diapirs and pillows throughout, um, and it is pretty thick. So, um, so yeah, as a as a not modern analog, they are actually very similar. Um, so how would one mine the REs in subsurface salt formation, for example, the Slato? They would dissolve them. It's dissolution mining. So the same method is what you would do for, um, for creating a salt cavern um, for either natural gas storage, um, natural gas liquid storage, or for what they want to do with hydrogen storage, or for um, when they, a lot of times, so in Ohio, for the e-salt bed, um, they dissolve it for table salt. So it's the same thing. You pump hot water down, let it dissolve, bring it up, and precipitate it out. Beyond that, I don't know what else they would do for the REDs, but they do something very similar, I believe, over in the, um, if I remember correctly, in the Black Sea. Um, is there a risk for collapse and dissolution? Um, it would depend. Uh, potentially. So a lot of times when they are, I'm trying to think, so the subsurface mine that it's, it's traditional mining in Ohio for salt underneath the lake, um, they've been mining it since the 40s and they do, um, they reinforce it though and they have tunnels. Um, when they're doing the NGL storage, these salt bodies, like it's an absolutely massive pillow that's probably the size of like perhaps Dallas sometimes. Um, and they're taking like a little cavern out of it. So in that case, no. Um, but if they get too greedy, there is a potential for that. And I think that's an engineering thing. So they try to, they try to make sure that they're not taking too much. Um, the kind of cool thing about salt though, is that it creeps, obviously. Um, it likes to move, it flows. So it kind of heals itself. So at the same time, it, um, 
there was it would it would eventually kind of slowly collapse in on itself but that's uh, within a couple of human lifetimes this <laughs> The, the mine I was in in Ohio, it started in the 40s, and you can see it creeping down since then. So it's kind of cool to see, but. Great, um, so Jordan, go ahead. A couple quick questions. Um, one, we have the same XRF as you. Um, okay. And on my best day, where under perfect conditions, where I've had a balanced breakfast and everything's just right, the best I can get is about maybe half a percent uh, uh, error bars. So basically we've, you know, it's more used for, uh, qualitative than quantitative analyses. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how you're, or yeah, how you're getting concentrations of hundreds of PPMs and so like how reliable have, those numbers are. Right. So I would not put money on this. So <laughs> just for like disclosure, um, a lot of this is preliminary. So I would take this as we see rare earth elements and all these trace elements in there for sure. Um, we have special calibrations. We have the rare earth element calibrations in there. And then we're in the process of getting those properly calibrated for salt, for a salt matrix also. So I have ICPMS samples that are going to be run this summer to get that done. Um, otherwise, I mean, my, I don't have an answer exactly why. So, um, but a lot of times when I'm looking at the errors, it's reasonable. So a lot of these are, when I'm looking through, it's not, it's probably a half percent um, overall, not absolute. So relative, not absolute. But again, I wouldn't put money on this. So please do not put money on this without like ICPMS just to kind of calibrate it properly. So. Um, okay. um, another quick question is, has anyone looked at, so you mentioned you were talking about REs and coal. Um, has anyone looked into the giant fly ash deposits that we've made and, and see if we can extract anything from those? Um, I don't know. I feel like I've read a paper, like I reviewed a paper in China that was actually looking at REs and other potential things in the fly ash. Um, that would be really interesting though, and that would be another useful potential. I mean, instead of just throwing it away, right? Um, cause that's what a lot of these are like with the shales, it's like, why trash it? Why not? Why not? Why not keep looking at it? So. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Jordan. Uh, David. Yeah. Interesting talk. Thank you. I, I've, I've got a couple of questions. One is the first one is, are there any relationships that you can tell between the rare earth element deposition and the water chemistry in terms of can you tell if it's precipitating in a shallow body of water with the salts at kind of surface pressure and temperature versus diagenesis and dissolution at deeper high pressures and temperatures so um the method that i've been told and I've been looking at is not a geochemical one. It is looking at the SEM. And that's how you can tell kind of where they're coming from is based upon the structure of the crystals that you see, um, whether, well, SEM, or you could do it in thin section, um, looking at those patterns and you can get an idea of dissolution, like in reprecipitation versus primary. I am unsure if you can do that geochemically also. I'm going to give it another disclosure. I am not a geochemist. I am learning a lot of this as we're going along. But also, there's not a lot of work on binding on trace elements and salts. So um, a lot of this is fairly new, and we're figuring it out as we go along. So I don't have a clear answer on that for you. I'm really sorry. OK, no, no problem. My second question is, um, you know, could we use provenance type methods for sediment and salt sourcing in basins and things to to locate uh you know if these rare earth element point sources are from alkaline magmas or carbonatites or something could we use kind of provenance methods to track back and actually locate 
the sources because that would be the mother load. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, so I know this is a lot of information and it's a lot. Um, so the Luan Salt stuff we have is a, um, that actually started off because BP want to know what was in that suit through zone and it's just like exploded since then. And so Brian is in the process of trying to figure it out. Just bit my grad student, just kind of based upon what should be and what isn't. And so I think our next step is trying to really, I have another grad student after that that's working on them and we're going through, we're resampling, we're getting a higher resolution and we have more wells around the Puma dive here and we're gonna go on shore too. Um, we're gonna see if we can figure out where it's being sourced from. Um, with the Luan, you kind of have like twofold things. So there's Highlands on shore. I think the Owatcha tells her right there. I am not from Texas, so please do not kill my Texas stratigraphy and geography. Um, I'm from Ohio, just for disclosure. Again, I feel like I'm doing that a lot here. But we have the Owatcha tells me some Highlands up in there. There's potentially the Arbuckles, but I think their timing's wrong. But then also because you have the rifting, there's carbonatites that are happening and forming at the same time. And so you have a potential of two different sources for the Luan. Mm -hmm. um, versus some of the other ones. So like the Silurian, you have the Appalachians right there. And so I think you got a lot of shedding off coming from there. Um, but I think we could, I think looking at some of the sediments, cause there's enough sediment entrained in the salts. They're not, obviously you can look at the picture. They're not pure salts. Right. So that would cool. be a really, yeah. I think that's what Jamie needs to do next. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Very interesting talk. Um, Rare earths are very insoluble in oxygenated water, okay. but they're quite soluble in anoxic water. Have you looked at any evaporate that were deposited during episodes of global anoxia? No. Um, are there any? I don't know that. <laughs> uh, so I can tell you why we picked what we picked. It's because so we have a core repository on campus. And these are quite literally the samples that we have on campus, but that would be an interesting point that, and that's kind of what we're going towards. Um, I know Dr. Ewing down in San Antonio, he gave me a couple more spots to go look at a couple things in Texas. And so um, I don't have an answer on that. I'm not a salt expert. Well, it, it, seems, it just seems that if you're, if you're concentrating on salts that were deposited during normal oxygenation, mm -hmm. you're, you can't expect to find any rares. But if you can look at ones that were deposited during episodes of anoxia, when mm -hmm. rares are much more soluble in wa seawater, mm -hmm. you, your chances, I would imagine, your the the concentration the concentration of rares should be much higher. That's mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, Lowell, Lowell's got one, so that's uh, one of the Sunamanian. Turonian thing. formation in the Maverick Basin. Look that up. It's probably yeah. OAE two. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, I stopped screen sharing. Hold on, I was gonna write that down real quick, so I don't forget it. Do I have more questions? All right, great. Is there any more questions? I would ask one, but I would like to hear if anyone wants to go first. <laughs> My compliments. This has been an unusually clear presentation. Please forgive me for running off. No, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, I tried. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Julia, I have a question. Uh, one of the slides that you showed close to the end, it was the average value for the elements okay. uh, from different salts. And I think okay. that might be, you know, connected to uh, Dave's first question. Uh, mm -hmm. Are those salts are ordered in age in age order from the top to the bottom? Mm -hmm. I'm interested to see the pattern of these element distribution with time, because hello geographic maps that you showed, those mm -hmm. basins actually are located in different you know latitudes, and mm -hmm. they are sometimes getting shallow, sometimes deep. Maybe mm -hmm. this signature shows you know somehow can be tied to. Uh, tied to the uh, paleogeography of the of of the of the environment or maybe mm -hmm. the paleoclimate. So, do you see some kind of links between that? I think if you put these in a, in an age order, 
that might mm -hmm. give us a kind of clue which direction we are moving. For instance, I see one of them that is a modern south, the, 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 or the yellow one. And yeah. Is that right? And, yeah. and oh, yeah. it's the purple one. The purple, purple one. The one. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Purple. Yeah, exactly. And the calcium, okay, it's it's very different to compare with the blue one or the yellow mm -hmm. one. And it mm -hmm. seems, I don't know, if there are placed in a time order that might say something. Um, yeah. Is well, it the case or have you looked at to the data from that point of view? I haven't, but looking, so the Salina salt, the gray one is actually the oldest, Silurian salt. Um, and then coming through, um, I'm not sure if there is, maybe it, it might be tied a little bit more to paleogeography, but it might also be, so with the Luan, it's kind of interesting because it's a massive rift basin versus the other ones, it's because it's, they're not like in the center of rifting. Um, they're not, there's no direct connection with them. So like with the Salado salt, um, oh, sorry, with the Salina salt, it's just, we have uplift. Like the um, Appalachian basin is very classic, um, Orland Basin, right? It's like, <clears throat> right? And so what you have is that massive arcs on one side, go back, it might be easier to show on the thing. You have mark, you, it's just uplift on the other side. So it's not directly associated with any of the magnetics. So the Luian is directly associated with the magnetics. Um, and even still with like the modern one, it's a little bit, it's not completely right there, but there is very close proximity to the granitoids. Um, I don't have any answer for you. I'm rambling. So, right. So, all right. Um, um, uh, I'm not sure it's a time thing, though. Right. One more quick question. Uh, do you see any kind of um, important message from the detailed, um, you know, record from the course, especially for the south? I agree that the average value is a good, you know, indicator. But for mm -hmm. the details that you have from, for instance, depths, let's say 5,000 to 5,300, mm -hmm. uh, is that really make sense in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big picture? Because as far as I know, the salt is very mobile and can mm -hmm. actually move because this, if you put the salt greater than two kilometers, it's going to work as a liquid mm -hmm. and can mm -hmm. actually flow very easily. And all this strat column actually may be, you know, Flipped over, maybe. Oh, you know. the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Just my question is, what is the great importance for the detailed uh, record like this? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something that I don't know. Just I want to hear that one. Yeah. So, uh, okay. In so the Silurian salt is not very mobile. Uh -huh. um, it's a little bit. It's not thick enough. Like it's the thickest bed in Ohio is 140 mm -hmm. feet. So what? 30, 40. 40 meters, right? It's it's not. So that one we could go down and we see a little bit of movement. It's a little bit of squeezing. Um, here, I have a, I, I don't, it goes, the presentation so long, so I don't show it. Um, here it is. Can you, so right in here, so this is the mine. And so a lot of this is still flat line, but you do get a little bit of the folding in here, but not much. Um, but see. you're right for the Luan. The Luan is, so my hope is that maybe we can use it to figure out the stratigraphy. Like this was this correlates with this, and this correlates with this, and this correlates with it. Like coming back up to the right. We have a lot of different things going on with all this. So looking at here, right? So we yeah. have we have another well, it's the Panther well, in the same dive here, um, and then we're getting a third well in the fall. Um, somewhere along the dive here. I don't know what they've called that one, probably the cheetah or something they like big cats. So um, my hope is that we can start working out some of the internal structure in this salt body and using the geochemistry. So if we can correlate, like this is the same salt as maybe this down here. Like, can we backtrack like the movement out of it? I don't know if we can or not, but that's one of my big goals is to hopefully do with this. I see. The um, yeah, good luck with that. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a big challenge. I've been talking yes, it to is. Frank, yeah, I've yeah. been talking to Frank Peel over at the BEG, and he's super excited about it. He's like, "I want to help." I'm like, "Cool," because I don't know what I'm doing. And so, like, 
Rochelle Kernan, she's in Australia and she's doing Precambrian salts. She's like, oh, it's really easy to do stratigraphy here. It's like, this color's this, this color's this, this color's this. I'm like, cool, can we do that in the Luyan? She's like, good luck. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. So right. we're we gonna see. We appreciate uh, Julie for your time. Great subject, interesting talk. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate a lot uh, for being our guest speaker, and I wish you a very good day, summer days coming. So, uh, if there is no question, um, I I'm gonna say goodbye and hope to see you again sometime soon. Yeah, I'm sure to see you guys around. So, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi, thank day. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Ortaza, can I also just jump in and say Yes, thanks. of course. Yeah, please, please. Thanks to you. Not only was this a great, interesting talk, this is our last one of the semester, right? That's right. Yeah, so it was a great way to end the semester on such an interesting talk. And I just want to thank the seminar team, Ortaza, uh, Lowell, Saloa, and Ning for doing such a great job and, and uh, <laughs> helping us, especially with all our faculty interviews, <laughs> really doing a great job uh, handling all the se seminars uh, this semester and last. So uh, thank you on behalf of the department. Sure, thank you. All right, perfect. So I think we are free to go, guys. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Yeah, have a good evening. Thank oh, you, bye. Julie. That was yeah. really interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Bye. <laughs>